It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, be before I start, I just want to repeat what I said two weeks ago, which is I'm hoping that everybody gets a chance to spend some time with friends and family over the holiday season uh, and that folks have a, a great uh, vacation. Uh, look, and thank you to the staff of the Legislative Assembly for being back here, uh, to all of the people that work for the Government of Ontario. Happy holidays. All the very best. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. Over the last week, the Premier has refused to answer basic questions in this House about the, his decision to hire a personal family friend to head up the Ontario Provincial Police. Why is the Premier refusing to answer basic questions? The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in the uh, spirit of the season, I offer the NDP a Christmas gift. I will respect and await the integrity report from the integrity commissioner, his report on the investigation, as long as you can see, three, see through to uh, vote on third reading and pass Bill 67 today. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario need to have confidence in the independence of the police and the integrity of government. Given that the Premier is refusing to answer basic questions in the Legislature and uh, refusing to conduct interviews with the press and is using the Integrity Commissioner's standard process that keeps his responses confidential, how can the people have that confidence? Minister? It's pretty clear that the NDP uh, refuse to understand or do not understand how the independent officers of the Legislative Assembly work. We have an investigation going on. I am awaiting that report. We Order. will respect that report when it Order. is published, but I think it is incumbent on all of us to let that independent officer— Stop. We're three minutes into question period, less than three minutes, actually. We've got a long way to go. We have an obligation and responsibility to discuss the public business. I need to be able to hear the member who has the floor, but ask the members to come to order. And I take this opportunity, I guess, to remind the members who were warned this morning, the warnings carry over into question period. And the way it works is, the Speaker, if your interjections are always out of order, as we know, the Speaker asks you to come to order. The speaker would expect you to come to order. If you don't come to order, you might be warned. If you're warned the next time the Speaker has to speak to you, you might be named. I hope that's well understood. Those rules will be enforced this morning. Where were we? Where were we? I recognize, start the clock, I recognize the Minister of Community Safety and Correction. No. The Integrity Commissioner. Where were we? Okay, I apologize. Final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> um, you know, it's more clear than ever. We won't get straight answers from the Premier unless he's compelled to provide uh, a public. Um, uh, a public response through a public inquiry under oath. So will the acting premier do the right thing? Admit that the only way to clear the air and get real answers is through a full public inquiry and join us in urging the integrity commissioner to conduct one as he could do under his act. Minister. It's clear to me is the NDP do not believe or trust that the independent officer of the Legislative Assembly, the Integrity Commissioner, has the ability to do this work. Stop the clock. Uh, the member for Essex will withdraw. Withdrawn. Apologize, Minister. Start the clock. Christmas cheer, I guess. As I said, the, in, the Integrity Commissioner is doing the investigation now. Let them complete their work, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the day, I believe you will find that the process was completely appropriate and used in every previous OPP Commissioner hiring. We are waiting that report. I wish the NDP would do the same. 
Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the member opposite just accused us of not believing or trusting the Integrity Commission. I'd say we don't believe or trust the Premier. That's right. Speaker, that's yeah. the problem. I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. Draw, speaker. In a letter to Ontario's Ombudsman, Brad Blair, the acting OPP commissioner, raised serious concerns about the hiring process for the new commissioner and about uh, a demand from the Premier's office to sole source a personal vehicle for the Premier to be kept off the books. The Premier's response was to claim the deputy commissioner had broken the law by speaking up. Most people think Blair should be commended for speaking up. Why does the government think he should be charged with a crime? The Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The willingness of the NDP to continue to drag the character of individuals who have been chosen from a unanimous uh, hiring process to serve as the interim as the commissioner of the OPP. I I cannot understand why you are not willing to allow the integrity commissioner to do his work, have that report, and then have the uh, process completed. We are talking about a hiring process, a hiring process that has been used in many, many OPP commissioner processes. I, I do not understand the willingness of the NDP to continue to drag down people's characters and to suggest that in any way Ron Tabner has done something untoward just because Response. he happened to be a 50-year police officer who worked in Etobicoke. Here, here. Final supplementary. This minister is tossing stones while her premier lives in a glass house. <laughs> this minister is tossing stones while her premier lives in a glass house. Does the government believe that whistleblowers who step forward and speak the truth to power should be allowed or even encouraged to do so? And if so, why are they accusing the deputy commissioner of breaking the law and demeaning other respected police veterans who have raised concerns about the hiring of the OPP commissioner? I wish to clarify my, my mistake. That was the first supplementary on this round. Minister. I, I wish to have clarified by the NDP why you are so prepared to throw people who have a 50-year career in the province of Ontario serving the public Opposition and, come to order. and disparage them in such a way after an independent hiring committee has said they were a unanimous choice. They had never had so many people come forward and endorse him as the OPP commissioner. It is shameful and it's unbelievable that after you ask for a hearing from the integrity commissioner, now in some way that is not sufficient, and you don't believe or trust that he can do that work. Shame. Once again, I'll remind the House: you have to make your comments through the chair. Final. Okay, I don't. I don't know what you're referring to. Final supplementary. Speaker, this is about the Premier and the way he's behaved during the hiring process of the new OPP Commissioner, and that's all this is about. And the public have a right to know whether their Premier interfered in that process, exactly. which appears to be the case. Exactly. The Premier has made it clear that he will attack and threaten public servants who speak honestly about his government. He sent a clear government signal this board. week to every public servant in the province by accusing the Deputy Commissioner of the OPP of breaking the law. We need to ensure the public have faith in the integrity of this assembly and the independence of our police forces. A public inquiry by the integrity commissioner will ensure that whistleblowers can speak without fear of retaliation. Will the acting premier join us in urging the integrity commissioner to use his powers under the Members Integrity Act to launch a full public inquiry? Minister. Members, please take your seats. Minister. I'm starting to think it's not, but it's actually Groundhog Day. Again, I will say through you, Speaker, this is an independent hiring commission, an independent process 
that included people who unanimously chose Ron Tavner to serve as the OPP commissioner. The NDP, which is their right, suggested that Order. they wanted to review the hiring process, and they requested that Opposition through the Integrity Commissioner. The Integrity Commissioner said yes. That investigation is going on now. Yes, that yes. report will happen. The NDP can't take yes for an answer. No. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Oh, boy. Boy, oh, boy. Speaker, my next question is for the Acting Premier. What guarantees can the Acting Premier offer that public servants who come forward to shed light on the Premier's meddling in the OPP Commissioner's appointment will not be subject to public attack, recrimination and possible legal action from the Premier or his Chief of Staff? Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional oh, it's, Services. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to learn, meet and work with the excellent people in the LPS. I am uh, constantly impressed with the ideas they come forward, with the suggestions that they bring forward to make our government work for the people, to have ideas that are actually going to make a difference in the province of Ontario. There is no doubt in my mind that we have been using those excellent ideas from mm -hmm. the public mm -hmm. service to make our province better. If the NDP would like to come on board and join our, uh, our quest to make Ontario better for the people, I'm happy to welcome their ideas. We've been doing that for the last six years, six uh, months, my, my apologies, from the public service, and we will continue to Spons. do that. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I am... Um... <coughs> Speaker, I thank the uh, member for the offer, but uh, New Democrats will continue to represent the 60 per cent of Ontarians that didn't support this government at the polls. Look, effective governments want staff who speak truth to power, government and side come to order. not afraid of public disclosure. Clock. Stop the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. The government side must come to order. Start the clock. Continue with your question. Effective governments want staff who speak truth to power, and they're not afraid of public disclosure because they know that government works best when it's open and accountable to the people who elect them. The Premier already made it clear that he and his chief of staff will take out anyone who challenges their actions. The Premier spent half a million public dollars to get rid of Ali Khan Valshi from OPG and is now claiming that the Deputy Commissioner of the OPP has broken the law without the protection of a public inquiry, why would any, any public servant come forward and challenge the Premier's version of events? Stop the clock. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Withdraw. Start the clock. Response. Minister. Speaker. It's a Christmas miracle. The NDP actually used the word power in their lead questions. <laughs> We're here this week to ensure that the power and the light stay on in the province of Ontario. We're here to debate and vote on Bill 67. It, in, it is incredible to me that the NDP have chosen to ignore the primary purpose of our reason for being here this week. Thank you. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question this morning is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Good minister. Great minister. Mr. Speaker, we all know why the legislature is sitting again the week before Christmas. We are here for this emergency session because Ontarians cannot afford to allow strike action to cause electricity interruptions, especially in the north. Mr. Speaker, in our increasingly globalized and competitive world, it is critical that the power stays on. Ontario has world-class industries that we can all be proud of, especially in the mining sector. And people across this province rely on our major northern industries to earn their livelihoods. This is why it is absolutely critical that we protect these industries from electricity shortages. 
Can the minister speak to why it is so important to protect mining sectors from power interruptions? Thank the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank this member for his important work he does uh, here in this place for his constituents. But he's a fantastic guy to work for on the Treasury Board. Uh, it's just great. You know, it's true, Mr. Speaker. Stakeholders from across the province are coming out uh, uh, in full support of what we're trying to accomplish here today, and the mining sector is no uh, exception. David Garofalo, President and CEO of Goldcorp, had this to say, a reliable supply of affordable electricity is essential to our mining operations in Ontario and something that the province must ensure businesses can count on. Anything raising doubts about our ability to depend on this vital service is an economic threat and a risk to productivity at a critical time of year for our business and for the people of Ontario. With Bill 67, it was important that decisive action be taken to provide our nearly 3,000 employees in Ontario with certainty that the power they need to do their jobs will be there when they need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unquote. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the wonderful minister for that answer. It's reassuring to know that our government uh, will continue to fight for the mining industry and Northern Ontario. I am proud to be part of a government that appreciates this sector and is prioritizing mining development. Of course, there are other large employers in Northern Ontario that can't afford to lose their power either. The pulp industry is another uh, example of an electricity-intensive in uh, industry that production relies on a consistent, reliable flow of power. I know that our government is committed to making sure that northern employers will not have to shut down and put jobs at risk. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the opposition is willing to risk these jobs, but our government won't stand for it. We will continue to make sure that the economy is not Question. threatened by power interruptions. Can the minister please tell us more about how important it is for northern employers to have a stable source of power? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the member coming up and visiting the great Kenora Rainy River. Uh, uh, riding, spending some time uh, in our vast region. We may visit a few other uh, ridings uh, in Northern Ontario and let them know about the delays that are going on here today. But listen to what somebody in the forestry sector had to say here. Eric Johnson for Ayanye Advanced Materials had to say about our government's actions. Uh, Ryanye, uh, Advanced Materials relies heavily on Ontario's electricity supply to successfully participate in the highly competitive global forestry products industry. Dependable electricity supply allows Ryanye Advanced Materials to employ hundreds of hard-working Ontarians to produce best-in-class products every day. We support the actions taken by the Ontario government and Minister Rickford, that's nice, to ensure the continued over the holiday season and beyond, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, acting Premier, sorry. Uh, Speaker, Deputy OPP Commissioner Brad Blair has raised serious concerns about the Premier's demand that the OPP provide a sole sourced, off the books personal pleasure wagon. The day after the Deputy Commissioner made these concerns public, Ron Taverner was quoted in the Toronto Star as saying, quote, I'm told it's not a camper van, but it's an extended size van. He's a big guy, and he'd have more room in that. <laughs> Speaker, can the acting premier tell us how Ron Tavener knew the details of this request weeks before he was to assume command of the OPP? Members, please take their seats. Deputy Premier, and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. substantiated allegations and accusations that happen inside this chamber because the NDP know that they have immunity continue today. Opposition, come to order. <laughs> the, uh, 
I'm, now I'm going to ask the opposition to come to order so that I can hear the member who has the floor. Nancy, you might get sued. Minister. Essex wants to attack and disparage people. I want to get Ontario back to work. I want to work with a team who understands that we need to make sure the power is on and the lights are, are on over the Christmas holidays. Please stop with the shenanigans, stop with the accusations, and actually vote for, for Bill 67. Response. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the government might think that it's okay to spend tax dollars on a personal pleasure wagon and have the OPP hide the cost. But on behalf of the people stuck paying the bill, I can tell you Order. it is not. And it looks like Brad Blair told the Premier the same thing. At that point, most people would give their heads a shake and admit that they were wrong. But it looks like this Premier got his friend on the phone and said, hey, once your commissioner, your top priority is my personal pleasure wagon. Did the Premier ask Ron Tavner to provide him with a sole-sourced, off-the-books, personal pleasure wagon once he became commissioner? Members, please take their seats. Minister. While the NDP continue to chase headlines, we will do our work over here. Our work today, our work this week, when we were recalled to the legislature, was to pass Number Essex, 67 to, to make sure that the heat is on and the power is out. Again, I will remind members, in, 19, come to order. in 2013, we had a three-day blackout for St. Paul's, that come to order. impacted many Member for in Waterloo, Ontario, come to order. including my riding in Caledon and Brampton Member and the for city Essex, of come to order. Three days, and it put the city for Timmins, come in. To order. It put the city in flux. We had people who had, were seniors in homes who couldn't get out of their apartment because their elevator wasn't working. I'm not sure about the NDP. I don't Spons. want to see that happen again. I want to get this legislation passed and make sure that Ontario is back to work. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before asking my question, I would like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Greetings and happy holidays to everyone in this house and across Ontario. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Well, we all know that the Minister has shown great leadership on the energy file since the June 7 election. We've seen yet more examples of that this week. I'm proud to be part of a government that takes the necessary steps to defend our economy. And on this side of the House, we are part of a government that doesn't play politics when critical industries and major employers in this province face the uncertainty of power disruptions over the winter. Major employers, and by definition, thousands of employees and their families in our province depend on a reliable source of power. This is another reason why it's critical for our government to pass Bill 67 before it's too late. Can the minister please explain why it's so important to our industry that our government continue to fight to keep the lights on this winter? Great question. Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we move through the sectors, not just in Northern Ontario but in Southern Ontario, industry is very, very concerned. Listen to what Roger Pava, the VP of Operations at Gurdot, had to say about our government. We applaud Minister Rickford. Yeah, That's yeah. nice again. And the Ford government for doing what we know is all necessary for our province's greater economy and the standard and quality of living. Gurdot leverages Ontario's electricity system to produce best in class steel products, and we employ hundreds of hardworking Ontarians while we do it each and every day. Any any threat to our reliable supply of electricity is a direct threat to the core of our business and the workforce we employ mm -hmm. in Whitby, Cambridge, and beyond. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the industry sectors across this province are concerned. They're glad that we're standing Response. in this place to ensure that electricity supply is uninterrupted for the province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Restart the call. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, I'd like to thank the Minister for looking after the large employers in our province, because they are such an integral part of our economic landscape. Ontario has always been known for powerful industry that drives economic growth. 
This creates jobs and helps communities like mine in Carleton grow and prosper. But in recent times, there's a particular industry in Ontario that is suffering because of matters outside its control. It's no secret that the steel and aluminum tariffs that are hurting one of the province's most important sectors. The last thing the steel industry needs is more uncertainty when it comes to their operations. Can the minister please explain how our government's actions ensures the steel industry will not have to face any more uncertainty this winter? Great question. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is day six in a little over 24 hours in accordance with the plan that was presented to myself and the critic, energy critic. Uh, the, uh, there'll be consequences, Mr. Speaker, if we don't pass this legislation. We know the member from Brampton Centre, who's a credible member of this provincial uh, parliament, said that they would use every available legislative tool at their disposal. And I read it in the Toronto Star, Mr. Speaker, so it's got to be true. I've been following this debate very, very closely, Mr. Speaker. And here's the reality. When it comes to Source Hydro, they're the nuclear deniers party. When it comes to the distribution of hydro, Mr. Speaker, they're intent on not delivering power. And when it comes to this legislation, Mr. Speaker, day after day, when Ontario wants an uninterrupted supply of hydro, Response. they become the new delays power party, Mr. Oh. Speaker. This is this has to end. The people of Ontario want assurances that their hydro will be uninterrupted, and hopefully later today. That's what we're Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Question two, Minister Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is to the Attorney General. Deputy OPP Commissioner Brad Blair is a police veteran with more than three decades of service. On Tuesday, the Premier made the serious claim that this decorated and respected public servant broke the law. The Attorney General, as the Chief Legal Officer for the province, you have the responsibility to uphold the law. Can the Attorney General explain what steps she's taken in light of this serious claim from the Premier? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for the question. Uh, as Chief Legal Officer for the Crown, uh, it is my duty to uphold the law, and we have a, a legitimate process in place right now that is being undertaken uh, by the Integrity Commissioner, who has a process that we respect. Uh, we will await the outcome of his uh, of his work. Uh, we uh, are, are, you know, he is an independent member. Uh, independent uh, member of, uh, of, of who, to investigate our government, and that's what he's doing. And so we uh, await his uh, his uh, investigation, and we will, uh, you know, I will, as chief legal officer of the Crown, I look forward to his report and, and following the recommendation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Let's try this question then. The Premier has made allegations about the current Commissioner of the OPP. If those allegations are serious, the Attorney General has responsibility to act. Side, come to order. And if they're not serious, the Attorney General has a responsibility to speak out. And let Ontarians know that the Premier was making baseless allegations about a decorated OPP Commissioner. What is she going to do? Response. Minister, Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand here with uh, members of my government and work hard to keep the lights on for the people of Ontario and the people. That is what the people of Ontario expect us to do. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to wait the work of the Integrity Commissioner, who is doing the work that he's been tasked with as an independent uh, officer of the legislature, yep. and we will await the outcome of his work. Here, here. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, Minister, just over a decade ago, uh, a grade 9 student at C.W. Jeffries, uh, Jordan Manners, was shot and killed in one of our schools. This tragic event brought to attention an issue that far too long had gone unaddressed, namely the lack of school supports and programs in our schools that were targeting low-income, marginalized, and racialized youth. 
At the time, Mr. Speaker, I was a Toronto District School Board trustee, and the Minister of Education worked with the Toronto District School Board to put in programs for those youth. We put in place a, a series of programs to help students get on the right track, including focus on youth and after-school programs. I, I, I'm talking about a, a young grade nine student that was shot in one of our schools. I'd like to ask this question, please. We hear the Premier and the government constantly talk about gun violence and making sure that young people have the ability to get onto the right track. Question. Does the minister understand that these programs that she's proposing to cut are going to have a negative effect on young people here in our city? Exactly. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And first of all, first of all I'd like to recognize any 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 tragedy that happens in a school is something that we can't take lightly. And that said, I can appreciate where the member's coming from. But what he neglected to say in his lead up to his question was he had an opportunity for 15 years to really get it right. And unfortunately, unfortunately, under the Liberal Watch, the education program and other basket became somewhat of a slush fund for pet Liberal Order. projects. And so we're going to get it right, Speaker. We're, we are remembering how important it is to keep a safe and an effective learning environment in the classroom. We are continuing Order. to support priority urban schools. And, Speaker, we are doing everything we can to make sure that both students and Response. teachers feel safe in the, in the environment in terms of a safe classroom. Thank you very much. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I cannot believe that the Minister of Education has the audacity to accuse the previous government of not putting in programs to help young people. We put in a series of programs across this province to help young people. What the minister is proposing to cut, Mr. Speaker, Order. are programs that help the most marginalized young people in this province. This was, a, this was an opposition, now they're in government, that voted consistently against the programs we put in place. And Mr. Speaker, over the last six months, we've seen no action on the Black Youth Action Plan. We've seen cuts to... I can't hear the member. I ask the government side to come to order. I assume all of you want to be here for the vote. Start the clock. Speaker, this government has had six months to take action on the Black Youth Action Plan, the anti-racism directorate. But what we've seen, we've seen them cut programs that go to help young people learn about truth and reconciliation, cut programs for our most marginalized young people, and this government should be ashamed of itself. Minister, yeah. you know what? I didn't hear a question. So let me tell you, Speaker, what we are doing. Here, here. You know, when it comes to making sure we're getting it right in the classroom, the PC government is continuing with the Lincoln Alexander Award that recognizes young people who have demonstrated exemplary leadership, so they can Perfect. lead Don by Bell example. East, we're establishing a network of universities, school boards, community Member organizations to East, come to order. pilot on-campus activities for Black youth to think about their future, so know that they have an opportunity to pursue college Member for Niagara West, come to order. funding black business professionals the member for Niagara West in terms of supporting young people in pursuing a future. And most importantly, we're investing $400 million in education programming for in STEM, $60 million, $28 million to Indigenous education supports, like a graduation coach, to make sure our Indigenous Response. students have the best path and support going forward. We're investing $20 million in mental health. Speaker, it's the PC government that's clicking up the Liberal Massacre. Thank you. Thank you. you stop the clock. Order. Don't preach to us. Order. The member for York Centre. Come to order. The member for York Centre is warned. Start the clock. The next question, member for Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. 
Late last week, the Power Workers Union had voted to reject a new collective agreement with Ontario Power Generation. In other words, the PWU is now on strike. Wow. Talks between the PWU and OPG have broken down. A strike at OPG would have a disastrous effect on order. Ontario's electricity Very. supply. Very. It would endanger the health and safety of Ontarians. Here, here. Our government must ensure that Ontario has a steady, uninterrupted supply of electricity. Here, here. Any labour disruption at OPG would lead to an electricity shortage in Ontario. And yet, our colleagues in the Nuclear Denial Party <laughs> continue to refuse to support an end to the strike. Mr. Speaker, what will the minister do to ensure that the electricity supply will be Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for all the work that he Wonderful. does for his constituents and representing him here. And I'm very happy that he's part of our government that puts the interests of the people first. Yeah, yeah. That's why we introduced legislation to, dissent, dis, to send the dispute to arbitration and protect the people of Ontario for um, power shortages. The legislation was tabled Monday, Mr. Speaker. We're now sitting at Thursday. I'm hoping the legislation does pass today, and if passed, it will terminate any strikes or lockouts between OPG and the Power Workers Union for the current round of bargaining. And this will make Ontario's electricity Member for Windsor West, is, come to order. will make sure it's not disrupted. So if this legislation does not pass, Mr. Speaker, people of Ontario, Response. families, seniors, and all Ontarians face the possibility of no heat or light during the cold winter months. That Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. OPG could not continue operations without PWU workers. This means that they could shut down all energy production within weeks of a strike. As the regulator IESO had stated that a safe shutdown of our nuclear reactors Falls, could take order. as long as a week. For Essex, Restarting those reactors would take approximately two weeks. This would seriously affect the Essex operations and stability of the grid. Again, Mr. Speaker, we are facing a potential provincial emergency. Speaker, Natural action is and required forestry come to order. now. If the nuclear denial party had their way, Ontarians would spend Christmas shivering in the dark. Can the minister please explain to this House why this legislation is so vital for Ontarians? Response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member, the member is correct. This is a uh, really a, an emergency situation in the province of Ontario. When 51 percent of all electricity generation in Ontario is produced uh, by OPG, a reduction in power supply of that magnitude is not something that we want this province's, uh, province's families and seniors and member for Waterloo, come to endure. order. Mr. Speaker, our government does believe in disputes that arise during contract negotiations are best resolved at the bargaining table. We, we as in government, for Windsor only West, come to order. when the public interest and public health and safety are at risk and the resolution is not possible. Again, the member is correct. This is the situation that we are facing now. The proposed Spons. legislation would prevent a, a severe disruption of Ontario's electricity that could greatly endanger our population. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, students, parents, and educators are telling this government there are very real consequences to immediately cutting $25 million from education programs midway through the school year. These programs not only support disadvantaged students across Ontario, but also provide vital work experience for so many. Mr. Speaker, these students have names, they have dreams and aspirations. Can the minister explain why she has tried to explain away her devastating cut to student opportunities as redundant? What exactly is redundant about these programs? 
Minister of Education. Okay. So, actually, Speaker, I, I'm really pleased to continue to be able to stand up and talk about how we're approaching yeah, yeah. the education program and other funding. Because, you know, as we went through line by line, we saw a lot of ways that the, the Liberal, former Liberal com government was sliding through the EPO funding basket. And the fact of the matter is, you know what? In terms Davenport, of come to order. where we landed, I feel very good that we were thoughtful, we were responsible, right and we're moving Listen. forward with programs that are going to reflect a safe and effective learning environment. Because, Speaker, Member for St. Paul's, it's come important to order. that everybody recognizes that school boards across this province receive, through grants for student grants for student needs, twenty-four billion dollars. Wow. And you know, the one program that the member opposite mentioned, uh, the one program that that was mentioned Response. in terms of tutoring, they, they, they can go forward with that program if they so choose. But on our side of the board, when we're spending $40 million— Thank you. Thank you. Member for London, uh, Thank you, Speaker. And back to the minister. The member from Davenport warned us yesterday about the long-term impact of this government's short-sighted decision to cut $25 million in education programs. Now we're hearing that London school boards have lost millions for after-school programs that one official described as necessary and needed programs. This is especially hard-hitting since one of the programs was designed for students who struggle with math. And we know that the Premier and his government have made quite the fuss about declining math scores. If the minister had worked with London school boards, or for any or any school boards for that matter, she may have learned how these programs specifically support our most vulnerable students. Why did the minister and the government choose not to consult with students or school boards before making education cuts? Yeah. Minister. Well, Speaker, with all due respect. Uh, I'm very pleased that we are prioritizing how we're investing our money, such as in financial literacy, because some of the articles that were coming out of the London area had some questionable maths put in place. And uh, the fact of the matter is, we are moving forward. And let me tell you what we're doing. What we've prioritized is an investment, a new investment of $20 million for mental health in terms of putting mental health workers right into high schools, and we're supporting our boards with mental health assist programs. We're putting $20 million dollars in French language education. We're putting $60 million into STEM. Employers, parents, teachers and they students need. alike are asking for more they focus on STEM speaker. We're looking at province-wide investments for parents. We're investing 28, over $28 million in Indigenous education supports, <coughs> such as graduation coaching. Response. We're putting $20 million in safety and anti-bullying programs like Kids Helpline. The list goes on and on, Speaker. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Last week, Ontario received another stern reminder about the culture of waste and mismanagement allowed to fester under the previous Liberal government. Moody's downgraded Ontario's credit rating, citing Ontario's debt and interest burden, which skyrocketed over the past 15 years. Speaker, we owe it to our children to fix the mess inherited from the previous Liberal government and get Ontario back on track. Can the Minister of Finance update the House on the situation left behind by the previous government and how we plan to tackle it? Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The hard-working member from Whitby is quite right. The Liberals left a horrible legacy in Ontario. They were spending $40 million a day more than they took in. And Moody's has indeed downgraded Ontario, and they stated it was based on, quote, debt to revenue numbers. Well, Speaker, let's look at those two numbers. First is debt. 
and the Liberals more than doubled the debt in their term, ballooning it to $347 billion. The other number is revenue, and we learned the Liberals artificially inflated their numbers with one-time sale of LCBO and, and OPG headquarters, GM shares, and other non-recurring revenue. Spons. Speaker, those are the facts they used as the Auditor General stated bogus numbers were used. Wow. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and back uh, to the Minister of Finance. It's clear, Speaker, that the Liberals left Ontario in a dire fiscal situation, which led to the news received last week. My constituents are concerned that Ontario has become the most indebted sub-sovereign jurisdiction in the world under the previous Liberal government. Speaker, a debt load of $340 billion, or $24,000 for every man, woman and child in Durham and Ontario. Shame. Speaker, it's unacceptable, and it's time. It's time for a fresh approach. Here, here. Speaker, the people of Ontario elected our government to clean up the waste and mismanagement perpetuated by the previous government. Can the minister tell us why it is necessary to get Ontario's fiscal house back in order? Here, here, here. Minister, President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Whitby. What are you doing here? <laughs> in 2009, my team at DBRS, the credit rating agency, downgraded the province, saying, and I'm going to quote, expenditure pressure raises considerable doubt about the province's fiscal resolve. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Liberals ignored that warning. Irresponsible, reckless, short-sighted, and negligent. And the NDP enabled this by begging more spending, more debt, and the Liberals ask, how much more? Mr. Speaker, it's this government that's going to fix it. It's this Premier, this Minister of Finance, here, here. this President of the Treasury, and all of my colleagues are going to fix it. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. On Tuesday, in response to the member from Guelph, the minister insisted that, quote, we are going to protect the green belt. We are going to not support any municipal plan under the open for business tool that would do that. But it's right there in black and white, Speaker. Bill 66, Schedule 10, Part 1, green belt protections will not apply to open for business bylaws. Does the minister understand that he cannot remove protections for the Green Belt and still claim that he is protecting the Green Belt? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Through you to the honourable member, our, our government brought uh, forward a package of uh, regulatory and legislative changes through Bill 66. One of them was our open for business tool. And as the, the member opposite would know, uh, a ministerial zoning order, which works uh, very similar to uh, the business for uh, the open for business tool, is a, is a top-down process where what we're proposing is if a municipality decides that uh, they have uh, a job-creating opportunity, so let's say they're competing against uh, another jurisdiction, uh, New York State, Michigan, or perhaps another province, that they can work with, uh, with our government uh, on uh, ensuring that, uh, that we're competitive and we're open for business. Uh, in regards to uh, the issue around the Green Belt, we've been very clear as Response. a government. Response. We're not going to uh, touch uh, the Green Belt in, in its entirety. Uh, that's our commitment to Ontarians. We made the commitment during the campaign. I make it here today. Supplementary. Speaker, nobody believes this government is committed to protecting the Green Belt. Before the election, the Premier was caught making a secret backroom deal with developers in which he promised to open up the Green Belt. He backed off only after he got caught. But now that the election is over, the Premier is trying to keep his secret promise to developers while breaking his public promise to the people to, quote, protect the Green Belt in its entirety. 
That's what the Premier said. Will the minister put the people ahead of the Premier's backroom friends and remove Schedule 10 from Bill 66? Yes. Minister. Again, Speaker, through you to the honourable member, we have been crystal clear in terms of saying to municipalities that have inquired, we will not put health and safety at risk. We will not put uh, clean uh, drinking water at risk. We will reject any uh, request from a municipal government to put the green belt at risk. The Premier has made that commitment. The Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Parks have made that commitment. I am making that commitment today. We will protect the Green Belt. This government will protect the Green Belt. Stop the clock. Seems a bit re redundant to have to say this yet again, but uh, once the standing ovation erupted, I couldn't hear the minister. I had to stand up, interrupting him while he still had time on the clock, such that he wasn't able to complete his answer on the record. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Mississauga, here and now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Our government is working hard this week to ensure the lights stay on in homes and businesses across the province, but Ontario shelters know this struggle better than most. Since 2016, they have been struggling to cover added costs brought on in part because of the influx of illegal border crossers caused by the federal Liberal government's failed border policies. Shelters across the province are operating at or above capacity. They have no choice but to dip into their reserves and open temporary accommodation to ensure no one left out in the cold. Meanwhile, Ontario taxpayers are left footing the bill. Minister, the federal government is more than 24 months late Question. paying their bills. Can Ontario expect to be reimbursed next year? Minister of Children, Family and Speaker, uh, to the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, I want to wish him and all members of this House, including yourself, Speaker, a Merry Christmas <laughs> and a very happy New Year. I uh, have been uh, working uh, very hard and diligently trying to secure over $200 million <coughs> for the people of Ontario from the federal government as a result of their failed border pro policies. I've spoken directly with the Mayor of Toronto, who has $64 million in growing in shelter costs in this city alone, as well as the Mayor of Ottawa, who's over $11 million that is required in shelter costs, not to mention $90 million in social assistance, $20 million in, in education costs, as well as other costs attributed to this uh, Ill illegal border crossing issue. The parliamentary border uh, the parliamentary budget officer the has Ottawa confirmed Center our numbers. The Auditor General in Ontario will also be moving forward. I am today, yet again, calling on Bill Blair and the federal Liberal government to come to the table and Response. make the City of Ottawa, the City of Toronto and the province of Ontario whole. Here, here, here. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the minister's response and her unwavering commitment to this file. Each month, more and more officials begin to brand the situation at the borders as a crisis. The backlog of the asylum claims is reported to be in excess of 65,000 and is expecting to take almost two years to clear. According to the Parliamentary Budget Office, each claimant cost the feds over 14,000. And instead of taking action, the Prime Minister preferred to say we are playing dog whistle politics, while his immigration minister accuses those who question him of being un Canadian. Mr. Speaker, we know the truth. Can the Minister tell us and all Ontarians if we should expect the crisis Question. to continue into the new year? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I can tell you something that I, as a member of this government, am a very proud Canadian, and I'm very excited yeah. to continue to stand up for the people of Ontario, yeah. but also the people of Canada, because every single premier in every single province and territory signed on with our premier and our leader to call for the federal government to make Ontario and other provinces experiencing this uh, backlog whole. We know, for example, that the parliamentary budget officer not only confirmed our numbers of over $200 million in social assistance and other costs with, with respect to shelter, we also know that the failed border policies right now by the federal Liberals will cost Canadian taxpayers one billion dollars if they don't fix this problem. So we are going to continue to call on them to reimburse us for our costs. We are going to continue to stand up for the people of Ontario and the people of Canada to have a confident, integrity, a robust response immigration process. And again, thank you very much and Merry Christmas, Speaker. Next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The Conservative government's decision to cut 27 million impacts disadvantaged students. Many of those who live in my riding of York Southwestern in Toronto, kids in Toronto are struggling. The youth unemployment rate in Toronto and Ontario is higher than the national average. Despite this, one of the programs affected by the 27 million education cuts is the Focus on Youth program, which provides employment and leadership opportunities for young people in uh, urban neighborhoods like here in York Southwestern, with a focus on at-risk children. Ontario youth deserve better, but the Ford Conservative has made the situation worse. Will the minister restore funding for these necessary Question. education programs, or will she finally speak directly to students to tell them why her government believes that their futures are not worth the investment? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And you know what? I absolutely believe in the futures of our students, every single student in Ontario. And we're standing up for students as well as their parents, as well as their teachers as well. There's no two ways about that. And you know, it's interesting because I, I submit to you, Speaker, that time and again I've stood in this House and said, we have to get it right. We are in a fiscal situation that absolutely demands responsible decision making. And the fact of the matter is, we have $24 billion going to school boards across this province in grants for student needs. And the tutoring program that the member opposite specifically mentioned was a matching dollar for dollar program that the former Liberal government brought in. Member and so Davenport, if the board forward. chooses to continue with that program, by all means, they, I welcome them to do that. But the member reality for Davenport, is, come there to was order. no transfer payment Again. agreement signed for that program. The former Liberal government had not signed it, and so Response. we have to be responsible. And that is why we're moving forward with other programmings to support our students at every. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. That's not the program. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister, I believe that the Ontario's youth are our best investment, mm -hmm. which is why I have tabled a motion to create 27,000 new paid work integrated training opportunities for young people. Right on. Cutting the focus on youth program sends the wrong message to our most vulnerable young people. Right. The Conservatives are telling at-risk youth people that they are not worth the investment and that they are not a priority. The Conservatives are in effect giving up on these young people before they are even gotten a chance. Shame. Mr. Speaker, again through you, I ask the minister if she agrees that our children deserve more, not less. Will she restore funding to these vital programs to our children? Members, please take your seat. Minister. Speaker, I'll tell you what our students deserve. They deserve a government that understands the fiscal situation, the fiscal realities that are going to burden them for years to come if we don't get it right. The best thing we can do in this House is make pertinent fiscal decisions so that our students aren't laden with a huge debt load on their shoulders as they enter Member their careers. We are a government 
government that it's going to get it straight so that they do not have that fiscal pressure on their Paul's shoulders to order. that they have to carry because of the mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. I'm telling you that we are absolutely getting it right. And shame on the members opposite for fear-mongering. Because here. let me tell you a little bit about the Opposition cuts that we did make. You know what? There was a pet project from the former Liberal Response. government that saw money going to an edible garden when there's already a program out there that has been running for 25 Same years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga East, Brooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this is one of the last questions of 2018 in this chamber, I look forward to seeing everyone here in 2019. Of come to order. Mr. Speaker, Davenport, come to order. My question is for to the Davenport, Minister of Health come to order. and Long-Term Care. Mr. Mr. Speaker, education is warned. This Mr. government Mr. acknowledges Davenport the importance of financial and social supports for those facing mental health issues. We made a promise during the election to make mental health a priority because we believe no one should have to wait for long periods of time to get the mental health here, and addiction here. services they need when they need them. Well said. Can the minister please update Member the House as to what our to government is doing to address mental health and addiction support in our province? Great question. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you very much to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for the question and for the great work you're doing in your community. Thank you. But the, the member is absolutely correct that we made a promise to the people of Ontario and we are making mental health a priority in the province. And that's why yesterday I announced that our government is taking immediate action mm -hmm. to address the critical gaps in our mental health system with the first wave of direct funding that includes adding more than 50 new mental health beds in hospitals across the province. This immediate investment will help reduce wait times and help build more capacity in our hospitals and help those in need of inpatient mental health and addictions treatment. Our government is committed to ensuring that each dollar goes directly to patients member to make for a St. Catharines, member for Ottawa Centre, member health for health Brampton health. North, <laughs> North. <laughs> supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that response. I am proud that our government for the people is delivering on a clear promise we made to the people of Ontario. Here, here. We are investing a record $3.8 billion in mental health over the next 10 years, including in Mississauga at the new Trillium Health Partners. It's important that we make the proper investments into mental health because, as the minister rightfully says, mental health is health. The people of this province deserve a connected mental health system that is patient-centric and connects people to the care that they need where and when they need it. Here, here. Can the minister please tell the House how we plan to make sure our mental health system really works for the people of Ontario? Well said. Great question. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member for the question. And yesterday, I also announced that our government is taking action and engaging with health sector leaders, experts on mental health and addictions, sector partners and associations, health service providers, the official opposition and the other members of this legislature because we want to hear your ideas, but most importantly, we want to listen to people with lived experience. We need to speak to the people who are experiencing mental health and addiction problems to understand what they need and how we can provide that care. I am proud to say that we had the first of our engagement sessions yesterday with leaders in the health field. Member for Hamilton field. Mountain, come we to order. We are committed to, to listening to experts for Brampton North, come as to well order. as people with ideas they want to bring forward. And I encourage all members of this legislature for to St. come Catherine's forward come with their order. ideas. I want to hear them because we need to work together on building this system Response. so that we can all deliver a connected and comprehensive mental health and addiction system that people so desperately Yep. Next question. Number from Steve Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question. For the Minister of Conservation and Parks. 
Two days ago, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Park boasted that 99.8 per cent of drinking water tests last year met provincial standards. But he clearly did not test the water of the 69 Ontario communities that are under boil water advisory. He clearly did not test the water in Gresson Arrows, where the people are still waiting for the ministry to clean up the mercury in the Wabagoon River. The government won't even acknowledge a single case of Minameta disease in Gresson Arrows First Nations or Wabasimun Independent Nations. Instead, instead of taking victory laps, will the government take action to guarantee the right of everyone in Ontario to safe and clean water? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and thank you for the, uh, the question. Mr. Speaker, in our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, we made it clear that clean water is going to be a priority. In fact, we are going to deal with what the previous government deal, deal with in terms of sewage, sewage going into, into our water system. When it, comes to, uh, when it comes to Grassy Narrows, that's why myself, as well as the Minister of Northern Affairs and Energy, have visited the community at Grassy Narrows and reaffirmed the commitment of this government to deal with the, the mercury contamination. Mr. Speaker, this government has nothing, nothing at all to uh, anything but be proud of the approach that we're taking on clean water. It is a priority for this government. It will maintain, uh, be, be maintained as a priority of this government, and we will take the actions that the previous government did not to make sure that things like sewage, sewage, Mr. Speaker, our water is not going in untreated. Here, here. Thank you. A, a number of members have informed me that they would wish to, pay, to raise a point of order. We'll start with the member for Sudbury. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, raise on a point of order. I want to introduce uh, Michael Bryan OB from Coppercliff. Uh, he was running late, so I just want to make sure that you got to the chance to meet. Welcome to Peace Bike Mike. Second, the member for Ottawa. Uh, South. I was the unanimous consent that uh, member table a little model of the, of the University of French Ontario for the rest of the day. You can place these small models of the Francophone University here in Ontario on our desks for the rest of the day. South is seeking unanimous consent of the House to be allowed to place a model of the Francophone University on all the desks in the legislature for the remainder of the day. Agreed. I heard some no's. Next, member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce to the Ontario Legislature the 2018 Canadian Gospel Music Award winner, Female Vocalist of the Year, my daughter, Brooke Nichols. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 67, an act to amend the Labour Relations Act 1995. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
I ask the members to please take their seats. On December 20, 2018, Ms. Scott moved third reading of Bill 67, an act to amend the Labour Relations Act 1995. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Mr. Bethlehem Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Ms. Surma. Ms. Surma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Smart. Ms. Martin. Ms. Trantifilopoulos. Ms. Trantifilopoulos. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Tani Gasol. Mr. Tani Gasol. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Bryant. Mr. Bryant. Most of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantai. Mr. Vantai. Mr. Should be song. Should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpocha. Ms. Carpocha. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. French. Mr. French. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwan. Mr. Borgwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosova. Mr. Rakosova. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Montez Ferro. Ms. Montez Ferro. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. The ayes are 72, the nays are 35. The ayes being 72 and the nays being 35, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. I would ask for the attention of the House. For a moment. Two weeks ago today, I informed the House that we were finished for 2018. Little did the Speaker know. Today, I believe that we are in fact finished for the year. It is interesting to note that this is the first Christmas sitting of the Ontario Legislature since 1869, which was pointed out earlier. I want to express my appreciation to our pages who have come back on very short notice to help us out this week. interrupting their pre-Christmas plans, and I also want to thank the hundreds of people who work here as staff at the Legislative Assembly of Ontario.
Their hard work and dedication are what makes this place operate. Without the efforts of our Legislative Protective Service, this House, its members and everyone here who visit would not be safe. Without our cleaning staff, the Legislative Building would soon be a mess. Without our Precinct Properties Division, our historic building would not be maintained. Without the Hansard and interpretive staff, interpretation staff, our words in this chamber would not be recorded. Without our broadcast and recording services, our proceedings would not be aired. Without our clerks and committees branch, our standing orders, parliamentary traditions and conventions could not be upheld and our standing committees could not function. Without our administrative services staff, our human and financial resources would not be managed. Without our legislative library and research services, our library would soon be closed and our research would not be as rich. Without our triple PR staff, our visitors would not be greeted. Without our catering staff, we would all go hungry. Without our technology services, IT would soon shut down. In short, this place would cease to function and the light of parliamentary democracy in this province would soon go out. Before I finish, I want to express on behalf of the whole House our thanks to the Press Gallery, whose work as part of a free and independent media part of a free and independent media is vital to the health of democracy in this province. Once again, I want to thank each and every one of you who works tirelessly to keep Queen's Park writing, and I want to wish you all Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I really look forward to working with you in 2019. Thank you. Order, Mr. Speaker, I have news. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm seeking uh, unanimous consent to move a motion regarding the immediate adjournment of the House. <laughs> Government House Leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to move a motion regarding its adjournment. Government House Leader, agreed? Agreed. agreed. Speaker, I move that notwithstanding Standing Order 46A, that the House do now adjourn until Tuesday, February 19, 2019. Here, here. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty has moved, notwithstanding Order 46A, the House do now adjourn until Tuesday, February 19, 2019. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Here. Carry. This House stands adjourned until Tuesday, February the 19th, 2019.